Amen. Good morning, church. How you doing today? Good, good to see you this morning. It's, it's winter time again, right? And so we had a great spring. So there you go. That was, that was it. And summer, summer too, right? It's all, it all kind of happens. Just there we go. That's it. But uh, man, I'm so happy that you're here today. Uh, truthfully, when I, um, when I saw the weather, uh, the weather was coming, I was like, oh no, here we go. Today is going to be an important day. Um, I, I want to get to it here in a moment, but I, I do want to just make a quick statement this morning. As you can see, this is going to be a different kind of day. Um, if you don't know who this is, I want to introduce to you uh, Representative Walter Hudson. Give him a hand today. Uh, he's here with us. I'm really excited about this day. And so this is, this is what, where we are here with this. And I, we're, we pushed pause on our series in James, truthfully. Uh, man, I had a great message. It's done, actually. It's in the can right now. And so, uh, so it's coming here, to pretty, it's here pretty soon. I'm, I'm a little ahead now. It's good. But anyway, we pushed pause today because some things happened this last week that's so important, so valuable that you need to know about it. And so we're going to talk about that this morning. Now, now here, give me a little, I'll just give you a little, little, little update on why this is happening today. Um, so this is what I talked about a few weeks back when I told you, I don't remember, but I told you, like, and there's things happening in our state that we need to be in prayer for and are deeply concerning. And, and so this is what we're going to talk about this morning. And I, I've just kind of really fought this through truthfully on, um, man, was it Tuesday night into uh, Wednesday night? One, one of those nights. I kind of all goes together. One of those nights, I, I had zero, almost zero sleep. Actually, it was Wednesday night. I had almost zero sleep. Um, no, it wasn't. It was Tuesday night into Wednesday. That's what it was. Okay, that's what it was. I talked to you, on, I think, on Wednesday, didn't I? Yeah, whatever. It all goes together. But anyway, one of those nights, uh, I was up all night long, and I was just with the Lord, and just, God, what do we do about what just happened? And you're like, what happened? Well, that's what Walter is here for today. Um, and then we talk, I talked, like, well, maybe we have this on a sunny night, or we have a, another time you come back, people can give us, you know. But I was like, no, 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 I think this is so important that our church needs to know what's happening. It's important enough that we take a minute, um, at, or Sunday, it would be more than one minute, and we talk about this. And so, this morning, uh, that's, what, that's what we're doing. And so, this last week, uh, something happened in our state house that, that is really important that you need to know about. And so, again, Walter Hudson, who has been a part of some of these conversations, uh, and uh, we've made this kind of talk. You know, this is not going to be a political thing today, you know, if you're like, I don't know everybody's situation here. You know, if you're left or you're right or up or down or whatever you are today, we're not going to talk about, you know, that. We're, we're going to talk about facts, today, what's happening. And, and that's really important you understand this, but, but, but Walter was there. Walter, can you just kind of give us, uh, you know, the, the Cliff's notes and just inform us about what, what's happened this last week that's so, that's so critical? Yeah, it's definitely not an elevator pitch that I can, <laughs> that I can offer you in about 45 seconds. It takes some background and, and understanding of how... Mm -hmm things work and sort of the legal context um, in which we're operating. And what I want to say at the outset is that you're going to resist believing that what I'm saying is true. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you're going to resist believing that what I'm saying is true is because it's so outside the bounds of what we as American citizens and certainly as Christians have ever contemplated as being possible in the world in which we live, the country in which we live. Um, but I assure you, and you can check my receipts, it's true. Mm -hmm. Okay, It is. Um, so to give you some background, we have in the state of Minnesota something called the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act was enacted in 1993. And part of what it does is it creates a number of protected classes and says that people in these classes are protected from, amongst other things, discrimination in public accommodation, right? So the, the list is all the things that you'd be familiar with. Race, creed, sexual orientation was defined in this back in 1993. Um, and that one's of particular note because in 1993, they also included a religious exemption for this, an exemption for religious organizations, churches, synagogues, mosques, faith-based organizations such as like Minnesota Teen Challenge, organizations that mm -hmm. do um, work with folks um, who need help on a, you know, a faith basis, informed by their faith. 
And what the exemption said is that if you're one of these organizations where your entire purpose in existing is to uphold a creed, uphold tenets of a faith, uphold doctrine, we're not going to force you into relationships and circumstances that would directly contradict your espoused beliefs. Makes some sense, right? Fast forward to 2023, last year. They changed the Human Rights Act. They created a new distinct classification of protected class for gender identity specifically. Gender identity had previously been what the lawyers call subsumed within the concept of sexual orientation, meaning that the existing category, the existing protected class of sexual orientation included within it the idea of gender identity. And because the category of sexual orientation was in the religious exemption, that meant that religious organizations, such as this one, were exempted from discrimination claims, potential discrimination claims, on the basis of gender identity. Well, when they changed this law last year in 2023 and created a distinct category for gender identity, they did not also include that new category in the religious exemption. And so the effect of that is today, is right now, that your organization and all religious organizations in the state of Minnesota are vulnerable to claims of discrimination based upon gender identity. This means, for instance, that if you posted a job, say you were looking to replace Brandon as youth minister. <laughs> uh, Which will not happen for a long time, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you had an applicant who was loudly and proudly <clears throat> transgender. Um, and on that basis, or in, in the perception of that applicant, on the basis, that we can't have that here because it goes directly against our stated beliefs. It, go, it, goes, it runs afoul of our scripture about seven verses in, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you were to say, we can't have you teaching our kids because of your obvious discontinuity with that which we believe, and that's the purpose for which we exist, that would provide the pretext for that applicant to turn around and sue your organization on the basis of discrimination based on gender identity. That was not true prior to August of last year when this law was enacted. It is true now, currently. So that's stage one of what you need to understand is what happened. Stage two is what we've been doing about it and why we're talking about it now, what the most recent news is, why this is now a cause for specific alarm. When religious organizations caught on to the fact that this had happened, the, the initial reaction was very graceful. It was something akin to, it must have been a mistake. They can't have actually intended to do this. It's so obviously unconstitutional, it runs against the most fundamental political notion that we have, which is religious freedom, freedom of association, all that First Amendment <clears throat> stuff that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, surely it must have been an oversight. And so that's how they chose to engage with it. And so they started to engage uh, the Department of Human Rights and they started to engage uh, legislative leadership um, in a quiet effort to try to get this fixed, to try to get the gender identity uh, distinction placed in the religious exemption. And the, the mechanism for doing that this year was going to come with what's called a policy bill um, or a agency bill, the Department of Human Rights technical bill. These things are usually pretty sleepy affairs. You don't really hear about mm -hmm. these on the news most of the time, but they're pretty common. Every time the legislature goes in and passes a bunch of laws, inevitably mistakes are made in terms of codification and where somebody put a colon or a period or whatever the case may be, um, chapter <coughs> citations. And so we have to have these agency bills that come in the, the next year to say, this is all the stuff you guys got wrong and pass this in order to clean it up. That bill from the Department of Human Services was going to be the vehicle, ideally, for making this fix. 
the religious organizations and members uh, within the legislature tried to engage with the department to make that happen and tried to engage with legislative leadership to make that happen. The bill came out about three, four weeks ago and it didn't have the fix in it. At that point, it started to become clear what the intention of this was. We've been talking to you, we've pointed out the problem, we've made it clear why it's a problem, you have an opportunity to do something about it, it appears as though you're not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so the time came to make it public. And so uh, one of our members, uh, Representative Harry Niska out of Anoka, um, brought an amendment to a House Judiciary Committee hearing where this bill, this agency bill, was being heard that would have corrected the religious exemption issue. At that meeting, not only was the fix voted down by the majority, we also proceeded to see one by one as different elected legislative leaders scolded the five testifiers representing the entire swath of religious faith in the state of Minnesota. We had Catholics, mm -hmm. Protestants, Jews, Muslims. They were told that their beliefs are wrong, mm -hmm. that the tenets of their faith are hateful. Uh, the author of the agency bill, Representative uh, Fredericks, said that they are comparable to chattel slavers, mm -hmm. okay? Um, it was a level of disrespect and disparagement and you know, really kind of a vile hatred mm -hmm. displayed um, towards the faith community just for believing what we believe, mm -hmm. which by the way, everybody has believed <laughs> That's right. since time immemorial up until about five minutes ago. Yep. Um, and so this is where we're at. They did that in the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, we made a big deal out of it in order to notify people. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to hear the bill in the Senate Judiciary Committee in the next week. They pulled it quietly. Mm -hmm. And when they pulled it quietly, we thought, okay, they've heard from the people. There, there were literally bishops walking the corridors of the Capitol, going office to office, lobbying for this thing, right? Um, so we've made a difference. They pulled the bill, they're gonna fix it. Last Thursday, I believe it was, it was heard in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Mm. They didn't fix it. Mm -hmm. This was overnight, it was one in the morning, mm -hmm. where they again voted down an amendment that would have fixed it, and again engaged in all this disparaging commentary um, regarding people of faith and what we believe. And so we now find ourselves in a situation where and again, I told you, it's gonna be hard to believe this. It's gonna be hard to swallow it. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm old enough to remember um, when a certain former president used to say that freedom is only one generation away from extinction. Mm -hmm. It's been a generation since then, mm -hmm. and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Like, we're no longer talking about what happens on the horizon if we don't do what we need to do. We're now talking about a rescue mission. We're now talking about recovering that which has been lost. Mm -hmm. Certainly in the state of Minnesota, religious liberty has currently, right now, since last August, you didn't even notice it, been lost. Mm -hmm. um, the impact of that is yet to come, but it is coming. Mm -hmm. And so we, we find ourselves in a position where um, the, the time is now mm -hmm. to get organized, and get involved and start plugging in the stuff that we focus on on Sunday to every other day of the week, because it's all at stake. Right. And, and so, you know, and again, I, I appreciate you giving us that insight. How, I mean, many of us probably had really no idea what's going on, right? Many of us probably had no idea this is happening and what's going on around us. And so I'll make it clear here too, the heart behind this is not to so our heart is not to disparage people that disagree with us. It's not to force people into a belief structure that is, that is, that is not it. You know, I, I don't know your story. I don't know all the people. You know, I don't know all what's going on. That's not the point of this. The point of this really does come down to the fact how, how important it is for us to, to consider the fact that a, there is a, we have not only a, a right, but it's a God-given right of freedom, of, of belief, that, um, that now we have certain members of our state legislature who would say that belief is dangerous and, and wrong, 
Um, now, I do want me to mention, too, Walter, is because, again, what could potentially happen here today is people could say, well, that's just one thing. There's still a lot of things we're covered under. You know, it's one little deal. You know, what's the big deal? What's the big problem? You know, why is that such a huge deal? Um, so if you would just maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, why this is, is such an important thing for us as believers to consider, because, again, it would feel at this point like this is just one small little thing. What really is, is taking place with things like this? So what I think is important to recognize is that is what's informing this, right? <clears throat> and you have to look at other pieces of legislation that have both been moved forward and have been proposed and what people are saying about them in their arguments for them. And uh, the short and tall of it is, is that the, the entire concept of conscientious mm -hmm. objection to state policy is being trashed right mm -hmm. now. Um, there's an effort that same day, Thursday was a hard day, mm -hmm. same day, um, last Thursday, we heard a bill in the Children and Families Committee on which I sit um, that would have the effect of removing conscientious objection as a reason for uh, exempting your child from the vaccination schedule in order to access childcare. Mm -hmm. So just to put this in context, for, for the entire, this entire term since 2023, when I was first sworn in, in this committee where we deal with issues of childcare and early childhood education and um, family assistance and what have you, we've been obsessed as a committee with the value of childcare. We've heard presentation after presentation and bill after bill about how early childhood education is so important, early brain development amongst children is such a big deal, it's so important to the workforce and to the economy to provide families and parents with this service so that they can go make a widget somewhere, it's more important than watching your kid apparently. Um, this, is, this is what we've been told. And yet they bring a bill that empowers providers to deny you that public accommodation. Why? Well, one of their testifiers said it out loud. He said, this bill is going to increase vaccination rates. Well, that's a heck of a statement. <laughs> By what means? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not gonna increase vaccination rates because this bill is gonna convince people that a medical procedure is good for their child. It's not gonna be through persuasion. It's not gonna be through consent. It's gonna be through coercion. It's gonna be by denying people public accommodation to a service that you've spent the last year and a half telling us is so essential mm -hmm. that we're gonna give it to people for free. Mm -hmm. So the, the underlying idea is, there is that your, your conscientious decisions, mm -hmm. whether they're informed by faith or not, mm -hmm. do not matter. Mm -hmm. You don't belong to you. Mm -hmm. That's the idea here. And so when you, when you copy and paste that, when you apply that to what's going on with the, with the church and with religion in general, there's this kind of pincer move happening where on the one hand, they are invalidating mm -hmm. the philosophical and uh, legal basis upon which your conscientious freedoms exist. And on the other hand, they're creating all of these affirmative obligations to treat certain people in certain ways and that's going to come in together and crush the church in between because what what limiting principle exists mm -hmm. uh, under which you'll be able to point to or ap appeal to to argue that you ought to be able to worship how you please you ought to be able to teach your kids what you want mm -hmm. um, you ought to be able to make choices about how you associate and for what purpose? Mm -hmm. If they don't respect your un, your fundamental underlying conscience, then why would they respect your association? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and again, what's happened too, you know, is that you know this this idea of a of an ability to to object conscientiously based on the ideal of of your religious beliefs that are deeply held and, and you know i'll say this as well that um and we talked this morning quite about about some of these things but um again the idea that we're having here is is not to you know we don't force people to do things that's that's 
that's how we think, that's how we operate as the church. What, what the deal is for us is that we are, we are seeing a, a, a line that has been drawn over time where you are given the right, um, you know, governmentally to oppose something because of your deeply held religious beliefs, right? Because again, these, these issues... These are not political issues, you know, and some people say, well, why do we talk about this in church? This isn't, this isn't, very, this isn't a very churchy kind of thing, and, and the, the response to it is absolutely it is. You know, it's, it's, and you mentioned this a minute ago, but it's true, that, you know, page three of the Bible, right, it's established that this is, in fact, a religious thing. It's, it's deeply so, in fact. Um, you know, the ideal of marriage and the ideal of, you know, these things, these are not, these are not, these are not things that the government... Um, you know, gets to decide. In fact, um, you know, if you, if you allow me for a minute, like, I'll talk about this for a moment, because we talked about this earlier today, too, that the idea of marriage is not something the government can and, and should be defining, because marriage is and always has been God's ideal since the beginning of time, right? Outside of the Judeo-Christian principle of marriage, before, in, you know, we don't have a, a full worldview sometimes, but you have to see worldview through the big picture that without if you take if you take abraham the abrahamic covenant if you take the the creation story you take those things out of the picture of the world you do not have marriage right and and we know this because every other culture that outside of christianity before christianity and and before judaism you know which from which we come before that instituted the ideal of marriage marriage didn't exist in the world Okay, so you can't, the government is not allowed to define marriage. The government has co-opted marriage to use, and and as long as they agree with what God has said about it, it's fine, because God instituted it, right? God gets to say what it is because God invented marriage, right? But when when governments and when things start to co-opt that and take it and, and make it something it's not, what you have is you have something altogether different. You know, and some might say, well, man, that's not, you know, I've read the, the Old Testament. There's, you know, there's people in the Old Testament that had many wives. And, you know, you can say, all, you, know, you can say, well, you know, marriage is one man, one woman, but weren't all those people back then married to many, you know, many? And, and you're, you're right in that. The answer, of course, is yes. But you have to understand that they're acting outside of God's plan for marriage, even them, right? Because at the very beginning, God said marriage is what? One man, one woman, united for life, right? That is what God said at the beginning of time. So anybody else, and it doesn't matter how great they were in the Old Testament, if they're acting outside of God's original intention, they are acting in sin, okay? Does it make, does it make sense? So marriage is not up for debate as far as, well, it's this or that. or No, marriage is what it's always been. And so what's happening now is you have a government that has co-opted marriage and co-opted these ideals and taking it and now making it a vehicle for other things to suppress people's opinions and, and viewpoints and, and such. People ha- can, can disagree, right? They can. They have that right given by God, right, as f- people who can freely disagree with things. But they cannot redefine what God has defined. And, and so what we're seeing happening is we're seeing the ability of us as believers to say, I, I disagree, you know? I, I disagree with this. And, and so and if you would talk too quickly, or not quickly, or however long, but, you know, because again, this is, this is an open, this is a, a first step, you know. And so for many years, the government has been taking one step, one step, one step. But for now, this is like, a, this is like five steps forward in, in, in this whole concept of, of losing the ability to make these decisions because, you know, Walter, how, how might this affect other areas of you know, counseling or, you know, obviously it's, you know, it's, it's hiring, but, you know, counseling and all this, you know, can you talk just for a moment about how that might affect those things down the road? Yeah, sure. So uh, another thing they did last year is they banned so-called conversion therapy. So th- this is the disparaging term that they've come up with for disagreeing mm-hmm. with the idea uh, that your son is actually a daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, if you disagree with that and you <clears throat> seek out therapy uh, in affirmation of your biblical, biological, objective belief, that's now a crime. Mm-hmm. Um, now, 
that applies currently only to licensed mental health professionals, I believe. Yeah. You can fact check that. It does not apply to clergy. It does not apply to, to you as a parent. You can still say whatever you want to your kid for now. But going back to what I said earlier, what's the limiting principle? Mm -hmm. If you're going if, if to say in the law mm -hmm. that a particular idea is inherently harmful and cannot be expressed in a professional context, well, why just a professional context? Right. Mm -hmm. what, what, what makes it, if it's so terrible to say it here, mm -hmm. how can we say it here? Mm -hmm. How can you say it there? What, what, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, there isn't a difference. Mm -hmm. And so the groundwork is being laid. There's this, this ratcheting that's mm -hmm. taking place where we mm -hmm. take a step and we can't go back. And mm -hmm. we take another step and we can't go back. And what it ultimately leads to is the abolition mm -hmm. of the church. Mm -hmm. That's what it leads to. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have, and let me go back and amend that. It, <laughs> it's, it's the abolition of the legal recognition of the church. Well, the and, church itself is be, never going to be abolished. It'd be the, the biblically you know, biblically based church, the one that believes in the, you know, the, right. the word. Like, there'll be churches that would, Correct. you know, disagree with this, and that's, that's again, they're right, but that's what probably, you know, they're, 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 that'll still be there. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. What, what we think of in terms of religious freedom, mm -hmm. those fundamental ideas of being able to gather, being able to, to worship openly, freely, mm -hmm. shamelessly, unashamed, um, that's going away. It's mm -hmm. being ratcheted away. And so the, <clears throat> the necessity here is to recognize what I think the church has always existed for. We had a really interesting conversation about this um, before coming up here, which is spread the gospel, yes. Make disciples, yes. But what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It has a tangible effect in the world. Right. Your pastor was telling me stories about Tanzania. Mm -hmm. The impact yeah. that planting churches has had upon the culture, mm -hmm. upon how people treat each other, mm -hmm. upon what they value, upon the, the government that they manifest. Mm -hmm. there's a, it seems to me that in the United States, we're miss, there's a gear missing in, in the Christian machinery that connects what we talk about on Sunday to what actually right. happens in our world. Mm -hmm. Right. And we need to reclaim that. We need to, right. we need to figure out that machinery, get it back in working order. Right. Um, because the, when we talk about having impact, mm -hmm. is, is salvation impact? You bet it is. Is it the most important thing you'll ever do for a person? Absolutely. It is not the limit mm -hmm. of what God does in the world. Right. And if you spend time in your word, you'll see example after right. example after example. And most of them have to do with interactions with a government. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and too, we oftentimes go to, you know, we go to Thanksgiving or we go to Christmas with family or we go to do something and someone will give us their opinions on these things. And we, because we believe in freedom, we'll say, well, that's your opinion, but we won't engage people, right? And, and we'll, we'll allow people to kind of say stuff, but we won't engage them back to have conversations about those things. And we'll, again, I think that's where this has to start shifting. And for, all, for a lot of us, we'll get to this in a moment as far as what we do about these things, but that is in part... We have to start thinking about that we, we can't see our faith as being compartmentalized, right? And it's, well, you have church here, and, and you know, you have my workplace here, and, and I've got my, my fun I have here, and I've got, you know, we, we tend to compartmentalize things and, and, and such because the truth is, you know, I, I have friends of mine who have, you know, grown up and whatever, and they've had all kinds of different view, viewpoints on things, but when they've come to Christ, and, and again, you know, people will say, well, you know, you, can, you can't say that. You know, I, I've been praying the gay way or praying this way for all of my life, and it hasn't worked. Well, here's the deal is that, uh, you know, the point is got to back up a little bit. And, and when people come to Christ, and they, it's, it's not like, well, i got to stop being gay, or i got to stop being this, or i got to stop being that, i got to stop. Even any more than you can't say, well, I've come to Christ, and, and, and I'm going to, you know, I'm gonna, on my own try to stop looking at porn or trying to stop stealing or whatever else. If that's in your heart as a pension, what you need is not to try to stop doing those things. 
What you need is a, is a, is a transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You, you need to come under the authority of the Word of God and under the goodness of what God's done in your life and then find transformation. And, and we have done a disservice, I think, in many cases in the world when we've told people, before you come to Jesus, before any of those things happen, you have to become a, a better person, right? you got to stop smoking, you got to stop drinking, you got to stop chewing and running out of girls that do, right? Like, you know, if, if you want Jesus, you got to stop all those and then come to Christ, right? And, and that is not only, that's not only wrong, but it's, it's dangerous. And it has, in some cases, provided the world we now live in, in which people think, well, if I have a, a tendency of, of homosexual thoughts, you know, or, or whatever it might be, or I, you know, I think I'm a guy, and I'm, or I'm a guy, I think I'm a girl, or, you know, or, or again, or I mean, pornography, or, or the million other things that, that, that so, you know, that, 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 that Paul talks about that are, you know, like, like, like make us unrighteous, right? We think we have to stop those things and then come to Jesus, but we, we fail to realize that it's through Christ those things are transformed, amen? And, and see, that's the difference that we have to start helping people understand. No, the, you, it, the point isn't to try to stop being whatever you're being. The point is to come under the authority of the word of God, under the authority of the Holy Spirit, and let him transform you and make you. Guys, we got to start having those conversations in the marketplace. we got to stop, like, pulling ourselves and disqualifying what we, be, what we know is true. I am transformed because of the Holy Spirit's, like, in, involvement in my life. I mean, without him, I'd be a mess. So are you, so all of us, right? We, we're pulling ourselves out of those conversations, and we're allowing the world to, say, to shape the viewpoints of, of how the world sees these things. we got to stop doing that, right? Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, it, when you think about that, when you think about the types of interactions that he's talking about, the personal interactions, the day-to-day -day interactions, the, the conversations over fa extended family dinner and what right. have you, um, you notice how they're not afraid to say what they think, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They're not afraid to push their beliefs. They're not afraid to say they're right and you're wrong. Right. Why are we afraid of literally anything? Are you kidding? <laughs> Look at who we serve. Look at what he's done. Amen. Amen. We're going to wake Hakey right now. I'm going to wake <laughs> And we're going we're gonna to hesitate. We're going to apologize. We're going yeah. to couch it in, well, that might be what you think, but right. no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, this is the hypocrisy of, of their position because they're saying to you mm -hmm. that your conscience is irrelevant, right. but they're taking every opportunity they can to impose their conscience upon you and your children. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's an example I won't even share right. this morning. Um, but you should be able to find it easily, mm -hmm. uh, of them imposing themselves to the most intimate degree possible mm -hmm. upon you. And, and so we got to shake ourselves of this idea that we have some sort of, of obligation, Christianized obligation towards niceness. Mm -hmm. We should be kind. Right. We should be gentle. Amen. We should be gracious, mm -hmm. but Jesus wasn't nice. Always, yeah, right, yeah. He told people to their face that their father was the devil. <laughs> yeah, um, and right. I'm not saying go around doing that, to <laughs> but it's it's you you got to have a comprehensive view mm -hmm. of what it means to be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. It's it's not all rolling over and mm -hmm. letting things happen to you. That is such a, if, if you'll allow me the aside quickly, and I know we want to have the opportunity for people to give questions. Mm -hmm. um, I find it, speaking for myself, blasphemous, the idea that the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, that the application of that in our lives is to just roll over and take everything. Yeah. 
Right. And, and that's the way it's often portrayed, is that, look, Christ went to the cross and died. That mm-hmm. means you should be weak yeah. and lie down and take it mm-hmm. and look for opportunities to die. Right. Yep. Yep. And just give up. Give that's up. too much. Yeah. You're, you're, right. ending, you're ending the story three days early. <laughs> okay? Yep. Because he didn't die for death's sake. Right. <laughs> he died to take on mm-hmm. everything. Right. And make it new. Right. And rise on the third day. Yeah. It was an action. Right. It wasn't about ending. Right. And it, and it, and it wasn't about losing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't about giving anything up at all. It was about gaining everything. Right. Amen. Amen. Ours is a culture of life. Ours is a culture of action. We, are, we look forward. Our reward is eternal. Amen. Activity. Yeah. To the glory of our God, we are never going to stop moving right. and praising yeah. and worshiping. Yeah. Why? So why, in light of that, why is our response to these mm-hmm. attacks in action? Yeah. I don't get it. Right? Amen. That's good, man. So, so we, want, we do want to open up for questions. If you guys put that, that on the board, the, the thing behind us. If you have questions today for Walter, we're going to have some time to him to be able to answer some questions. So you can text them to this number, and, and then Pastor Chad's going to, going to you know, go through those and, and work through some questions. Again, if you have questions, text that number. It'll go right to Pastor Chad, and, and, and we'll try to get through as many as we can today. But, but as you do that today, I do want to have, because one question is going to come up for sure, is, okay, great, we've we, we got to deal something about this. What do we do? <laughs> you know, and... And, and I, I mean, we had our marriage retreat this last weekend, and I mean, I, feel, I, I was asked that question a hundred times, and it's a good question. So, I mean, Walter, you, you know, if you would maybe just give us some insight, you know, what do we do about this? What, you know, what do we want to, what do we do? So, if you think of this in terms of a battle that mm-hmm. we're engaged in, before you go into battle, you need to be organized. You need to have your ranks in order, right? So, that's the, the stage that we find ourselves in, is we need to be organized. The troops need to be trained. The supply lines need to be laid. Um, And what that means in practical terms is there are organizations that already exist that are working on this stuff. So Restore Minnesota, I know Dell Witherington is is, uh, one of your friends who attends here when he can. Mm -hmm. Um, Fantastic organization. Get involved with it. The Minnesota Family Council, get on their email list. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Conference, get on their email list. They're doing good work. Minnesota Citizens Concern for Life, MCCL. Get on these email lists, Google my official page, sign up for my legislative updates. Um, It's not campaign stuff, it's legislative information about what is happening at the Capitol. You have to know, you have to have your reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. You have to have your lay of the land. You have to Mm -hmm. know what's going on before Mm -hmm. you could do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And then you you have to have your ranks in order. You have to be aligned with organizations that are already doing this work. Those would be the two places I would start, and you can do those in five minutes today before you leave the building, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, Beyond that, I would say that the most important thing you can do is what you're already doing as a Christian, which is spend time in the Word, Mm -hmm. spend time in prayer, but ensure that you include within that focus what it is that you're being called to do specifically. Amen. Because this broad question of what can we do, Mm -hmm. the answer is different from person to person to person to person. Mm -hmm. Where has God placed you? What is your ministry? Yeah. Are you a father? Are you a police officer? Are you a mother? Are you a kid in school? Mm -hmm. Right? Like there, we all have different ministries to which we've been assigned. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest hangups that we have uh, as Christians is focusing on some role or some sphere that is outside the scope of where we find ourselves and using that as an excuse to not do anything where we're at. Right. You know, well, I'm not a legislator, so there's nothing I can do about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, There is something you can do about it in the ministry that you've been given. Right. And that's really important you said there. I got to say that again because it's so good. We oftentimes think of these in terms of, well, I... You know, we, I voted and it doesn't work, or I did this, it doesn't work, right? G- guys, that's not how we're in the position we are today because people voted, right? We got, we got in this position we're in today because people said, 
you know, and again, I would say wrongly, but they had a point, and they said, we can make a difference by talking about what we believe, right, by, by engaging in conversations about those things, by having a, 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 a construct of the world by which we can believe and, and can talk and can communicate, right? That's, that's how we are in the position we are today, not because of voting, because a lot of people believed what they believed and talked about it a lot, right, and, and engaged people. And, and again, as believers, we have the greatest, most transformational news possible, and yet somehow we bought this lie that says, well, God, Jesus is going to come back for us, and it's all not going to matter anyway, so I'm just going to give up till the end, right? Man, that, 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 that thought process has got to stop. Amen? Amen? We, we can't think that way anymore, because if we think that way, well, we can't even think about it, it doesn't matter. Guess what? Then you were right. I mean, we, then, we won't, then it won't change. And, and what's at stake here isn't just like, uh, you know, I mean, some, you know, some, some ideals and, and at stake, the state capital over else. What's at stake here is not even my life and maybe not even the life of my children, right? My kids are strong. They know, they know Jesus. They love him and such. And, you know, that, that's the reality. What we have to be concerned about is not, not, even, not us and, and not our children as much, although sometimes it is our children too, but our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and, and, and their children, right? They need to be in, alive in a world where freedom is an, an ideal, right? Amen? They need to be alive in that. And, and oh, I could go on this one for a long time, the freedom. I won't do that. Because we do need to talk about some, some questions here. And so, Pastor Chaff, you would give us just a couple questions that he could answer. That's a very good question. Uh, I, I am not entirely certain because I'm not familiar with how s homeschool co-ops are structured, like what type of organization they are. Um, but in a broad sense, I would certainly say there's no place to hide from this. Mm -hmm. If they're willing to come here, if they're willing to come after your church, like they're not going to allow you some pocket <laughs> to mm -hmm. hide in um, and, and uh, be absolved from this. And that also applies, by the way, to another question that might be asked, which is, is it time to pick up and leave and go to another state? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, maybe, again, <laughs> again, that's something that has to be prayerfully considered. What are you being called to? Right. Yeah. But I will tell you, if, if you're being called to Florida, congratulations. <laughs> um, but, but just know that too is not, you're not going to escape it. Yeah. It's, right. it's hot. It has skipped the border from Canada to here. Yeah. It's in the bloodstream now. Right. We, we got to combat it. Yeah. Uh, another question that I've got is uh, on a, is this being appealed to a higher court as a threat to our constitutional first amendment hmm. rights? So another fantastic question. The answer is inevitably it will be. The problem with that is in order for something to be heard before court, there has to be a case. And in order for there to be a case, there has to be somebody withstanding. And what that means is somebody who has been harmed. Mm -hmm. So the first church uh, has to take the hit mm -hmm. of getting sued and all the legal costs that come with it. Mm -hmm. and, and then we can potentially uh, move this thing up in the courts. And I do believe ultimately it would be overturned. But that is hardly the path that we should resign ourselves to. Mm -hmm. It can still be fixed. Yeah. Uh, another question was, how can we find eight representatives voting against the six? And how can we... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got to say it probably, right? <laughs> no, but it also needs to be done. And how can we legally put pressure on them to change their position? So, <clears throat> recognizing the... The stage on which I'm on. Uh, yeah. Um, I will say that you know, I'll point you to the legislative website, right? So we have a fantastic, we really should be proud of at least one thing in Minnesota, and that's the quality of our legislative website, which does a fantastic job of keeping records of votes that were taken in our committees. So we're talking about both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, so you can go back and look at the records and find this. You could also probably just Google it, and you would find it pretty readily. There's been a, a decent amount of reporting. Um, Alpha News, in particular, has been reporting on this, and um, mm -hmm. they'll be able to tell you who did what. And how do we put pressure on them? Uh, 
so it's, it's gonna be through the various forms of engagement, right? Whether it's writing an email, uh, making phone calls, physically going down there. Yeah. Like just getting half a dozen people and mm -hmm. taking a day and going down to the Capitol and just looking for open office doors and knocking on them and saying, mm -hmm. hey, do you got five minutes? I wanna talk to you about this makes a huge impact. And if, if, if you have teams of six people who hmm. are willing to do that for an entire week, yeah. the word's gonna get around. Right. And the, the sense, because it's so rare for people to do that, mm -hmm. the leverage of that style of participation is very high. Yeah. It impresses people that you were willing to take time out of your day and come down there and make your voice heard. And that's interesting that you said that because I've heard that a lot of times too. Again, we can go to the state capitol or whatever and just knock on doors and say, hey, guess what? I want to talk to you about this thing, right? And you know what else is interesting? That's how the other side did it, right? That's how they started this process many, many years ago. We can do those things too, and we should do those things, right? That's not like, oh, well, I don't know. No, that's what we should be doing, those kind of issues, right? That's a, that's a, great, that's a great piece of advice. Pastor Chad. That's good. Yeah. L listen, I would say it matters more to them than it mm -hmm. does to us. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's actually a pet peeve of mine that we talk about religious liberty and religious freedom mm -hmm. as if there's something particular about religion that makes it extra special mm -hmm. when it comes to issues of conscience. Right. Not true. Mm -hmm. All right. Our God given rights should be intact regardless of what we believe. Um, there, there is, what's that called, common grace? Mm -hmm. the, God, it, it rains on the just and the unjust alike, right? Mm -hmm. So you should be particularly concerned if you're not a person of faith, because if they're willing to do this to the church, they will do literally anything to yeah. you. Right, yeah. And that's, that's a great point in that if we can help engage people in understanding and, and, and taking these ideals and teasing them out you know, lo logically, and says, yeah, this affects me right now, but what happens when your thing gets affected? What happens if somebody decides that what you believe in is no longer valid or no longer okay? How would you respond to that, right? And so, again, if there's people that, and that's how you could also a, appeal to the leadership, uh, you know, in, in our state and say, okay, I mean, I, I, I respect your opinion on this. I, I disagree with it, right? But what happens if somebody tells you that what you deeply hold and believe is not any, any longer valid, right? And, and, and make people say it, right? Let's say, no, no, you gotta answer this question. Like, you gotta answer the question that says, what happens when what, what you believe is no longer okay, right? Because if that's, because freedom is not, it's not a religious ideal. It's, well, it actually is, truthfully. Like, you know, that, yeah, that's, it's a whole ordeal. That's a whole ordeal, right? But we all get to live under this, this umbrella of freedom uh, until we don't get to do it anymore. And, and that includes people on both sides of the fence. I, I, would, I don't want someone who disagrees with me to not have the freedom to be able to say those things, right? That's, that's how freedom works. But when people start taking those things away from us, right? And, and again, this is not a political thing. It's a God-given right. That God's given the, the right to humankind to have certain freedoms, right? That's not, again, that's not just a constitutional thing. You know, the Constitution, that's not their deal, right? God gave that to people. And, and so, so we have to help other people understand, if, if they could take this from you, they'll, what else would they, you know, take this from me, they could take something from you too. People need to think about this, these things in those terms, or, or we're all, we're all going to miss it, right? Yeah. 100%. One more. So to the first prong, are there other states that have specifically done this, created gender identity and then not had an exception in uh, their Human Rights Act? I don't know. That is a worthy question to pursue. Um, I suspect, based upon what we're seeing in other areas, 
that it's likely part of a coordinated national effort in the several states, wherever they have the right political composition to move these sorts of things forward, that this is an, an idea that's part of a national strategy. I, I don't believe for a second that people are coming up with ideas all by themselves mm -hmm. and moving forward with them um, individually. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding timeline on other things, if I'm understanding the, the intent of the question properly, anything that hasn't been passed into law yet is certainly subject to being stopped. And so that's why the importance of getting the ranks in order, getting organized, establishing the supply lines is so important right now. And, and it starts with just like the conviction that I'm gonna do something about this mm -hmm. uh, because our, before we can engage in the rescue mission, we have to engage in the triage, mm -hmm. right? Right. Of what's the problem? Where's the bleeding? How do we stop it? Mm -hmm. That's where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. And then once we've stabilized the patient, we can start to look at ways right. to recover. Man, it's excellent. You, 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 you're great at this. <laughs> I don't know, man, man, you answer you this well. It's, you're great at this. Yeah. Yeah. Give. Give him a hand. Give him a hand today. Yeah, continue. Give him a hand today. As as how you can come up and just just quickly play for a little bit. We we do need a transition. It's not ten nineteen. And um, would would you hang out for a little bit and just ask questions between services? Is that you absolutely okay. okay. Sure. So he's gonna hang out and ask ask questions for a little bit and serve different services. And we'll do this again next service as well. So um, you know certainly if everybody stayed, people that come to next service won't be able to be here either. And so you know keep that in mind. But. Um, you know, as I do want to, I do want to leave us with a, a thought from Scripture today, and I promise this won't be long. Don't be like, oh no, he's preaching. Oh no, no, I promise it's not long. I've been thinking about this a lot in this this last week. Um, King Hezekiah, if you don't know his story, King Hezekiah from the Old Testament, Second Kings, um, and this is in chapter twenty. He's a godly king. He, God did a lot of great things through King Hezekiah, um, and, and so much so, in fact, that he was he his. He lived under a time of such great peace and such prosperity and all this, such a great time. Um, and, and the story is, it's a long story and such, but um, at the end of his life, uh, you know, he did something that was really foolish and, and he's going to pay a price for it. And, and of course, Isaiah, the prophet, came to him and gave a, a prophecy that basically said, Hezekiah, you know, because of well, what you did, someday all your spoils, all the things you have will be taken away from you to Babylon, carried off to Babylon, and your, many of your sons will also be carried off to Babylon, okay? So that should have been like, whoa, I gotta repent, this is, this is wrong, this is not okay, I can't think this way. But listen to what King Hezekiah says, he says, man, my glasses are down there, I'll try this my, my best I can, I'm getting old. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, again, again, remembering what, he just, what Hezekiah just said, you're gonna lose your sons, you're gonna lose all this stuff. Hezekiah said, this message you have given me from the Lord is, thank you, babe, is good. It's good. Because the king was thinking, at least, at least there will be peace and security in my lifetime. You, know, you read that, you think, how in the world could a godly, wonderful king say something like that? Right? How, how could it happen? I, mean, I think what ha what's happened is living under the God-given the God blessing of peace for so long, none of us know anything different. We get, we get accustomed to it so much, we forget that we make some mistakes. And, and again, there, guys, let's, let's be honest here. You know, if your sexual sin isn't homosexuality or if it's not, you know, that you're, you know, like, or ladies, I'm not guy, so everybody. If it's not homosexuality, if it's not that you're, you know, transgender and those things, and those are sin, and I'm going to be honest, be clear. I've heard, the, I've heard people try to give biblical, you know, accounts, all the Bibles, and that, that's, that's baloney. It really is. I promise you that. It's baloney. Those are sins. But so is sleeping around. So is pornography, right? So, I mean, there's so many other things that we take, we say, well, that's, eh. no, it's all sin, right? It's all, it's all like that. And when we, when we take a back seat to, to, to holiness and purity and righteousness and say, well, this one matters, but mine, eh, mine doesn't matter, right? We take attitudes like this, where God speaks to us and God gives a clear word and we say, well, 
as long as there's peace and safety in my time, this word's good you're giving me. God, help us. Right? God, help us to not think this way anymore. And I'm calling you as a church to not think this way, to get involved, to get, to get, to, to repent if you have to, right? To get involved, to get a construct of the world that God can use you to, 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 to not argue, but to, but to give a defense of your faith. Because for so long, the church has not done that. We're going to do that at Bridgeview Church. Why would I do this? Why would I take a time out? Matt? Why would I, like, with, like, you know, I, I seriously have been like, oh, man, like, I've been nervous about this. I don't know why, but I, I have been. Why would I do this? Because now 500 people are going to know what's happening. And I hope 500 people more know and, ten, and thousands and thousands more know at least what's happening and can form a construct because I don't want to say, if God speaks to me, I don't want to say, well, as long as there's peace and safety in my time, then this word's good. No, it's terrible. What's happening in our culture is terrible. I don't want my grandchildren to grow up in a world where that's the, that's the, that's the viewpoint. I want them to grow up in a world where freedom is there, right? I don't want that. Now is it going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. But I know what will happen if I don't engage and think and talk and, and pray before I go to Thanksgiving. And if I know someone's going to be there to like give a, a, a dissenting voice, God, give me wisdom, give me discernment, give me understanding, Lord, give me Give me, give me the freedom to speak your truth and then expect and pray, God, you're going to show up in, in my grandma's, you know, dinner at my grandma's house and, and I'm going to lead someone to Christ. Man, why do we give this stuff up? Because the enemy has lied to us and told us it doesn't matter. Your voice doesn't matter. That's what's at stake and I'm not standing for it. Amen? Who's with me? Stand with me this morning. Let's pray. Jesus across this room this morning. Let's pray and ask God to bless and minister. Lord, there, is, there are eyes open this morning. God, in my, my mind also, God, I'll be honest with you, God, my eyes have been opened in the course of this last year to what's happening. And God, we won't stand for it. And God, we're not going to be, we're not going to be mean. Lord, we're not going to be cruel. We're not going to be angry. We're not going to be resentful. Lord, the word of God shows us that we don't have to be because Lord, your Holy Spirit already leads in front of us. Lord, to lead people to truth that, God, we have found and discovered and has transformed our lives. Lord, God, use our voices, use our minds, use our hearts, use our spirits, Lord Jesus, to see transformation happen across this land, across this nation, across this world. Jesus, I pray for a revival. Lord, across America, God, in in the worst times, God, throughout history, have become the best times. Because your people have awoken and realized there's a problem and we're going to deal with this. And so, Lord, do that through us and in us, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name. And I want to pray also for those, if there's someone here today and you deep down in your heart are struggling with some sexual sin and you feel there is no way out and you said, God, I, I don't want this and it's like, it's there. Man, I want to, I, I want to pray over you this morning, Jesus. Send your power. Lord, send your wisdom. Lord, turn that thought around that the enemies told them that there's no way out. Lord, turn that around in their hearts. Lord, to start seeing that there is a way out. It's not by trying to stop this stuff harder. It's by coming under the authority of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And Jesus, when we do that, you transform lives and you do it over and you do it over and you do it over again. Lord, there's hope. Lord, when you're in the house. And so I pray, God, that you would help people to to see that and understand that. And Jesus, transform this state. There is hope here. In Jesus' name, we pray this morning. And everyone says, amen and amen. God is good this morning, right? Come on this morning. God's good. So again, Walter will be here with us today as as long as needs needed. I'm I'm already speaking for you, man. I don't know. I'm sorry. You know, but uh, here's the answer question. If you have more Uh, We'll do this again next service. Uh, May God bless you and keep you. Friends, it's here, right? It's here. There's hope. Amen? There's hope. There's hope when Jesus is in the house. I love you. I thank you. There's not a lot of churches you can do this in. You can do this here. Amen? And I'm thankful for that. Amen? You are a good church. Bless you. We'll see you again next Sunday morning. Have a great week. Hallelujah.